so welcome everyone welcome everyone this evening we continue our 30 week bible study title the people of the promise kingdom divided covering 15 books in the old testament this study covers a challenging but important period in israel's history now i invite you to turn to your bibles to second chronicles chapter 34 verse 27 because your heart was responsive and you humbled yourself before god when you heard what he spoke against this place and its people and because you humbled yourself before me and tore your robes and wept in my presence i have heard you declares the lord so let's look to god in prayer before we go into our lecture our father in heaven lord we thank you for this great opportunity one more time to come into thy presence lord we humble ourselves before you lord god of faithfulness your servant josiah restored your holy words to people longing for your guidance lord this evening help us to learn your scriptures so that we might carry your words in our hearts in our words and in our actions this we pray it in jesus precious name amen friends <clears throat> the 2021 consensus suggests that christianity is no longer the majority religion in so called christian country but no matter what the hyperbolic post on social media say there is nothing surprising or unexpected twist here in our study how familiar is, is this situation in israel compared to our modern world israel has failed so catastrophically that we are told that the people are behaving worse than the nations that lived on the land before them so this evening the final message to israel is an important message to us as we face our challenges as well so for more details let's move into our lesson so here is our outline god's righteousness prevails through perils god's righteousness prevails through promises god's righteousness prevails through perils god's righteousness prevails through promises by the time of our text begins the north kingdom was gone because of their wickedness god sent the assyrians to the northern kingdom and many of the israelites were deported to assyria meanwhile the southern kingdom of juda carried on for some time more with the rest of the kings manasa was 12 years old when he became the king and he reigned in jerusalem 55 years that's a long time our test begins in second kings verse 21 chapter 21 where hezekiah's son takes the throne we saw last week that hezekiah is compared favorable to king david because he reversed the worship patterns of the nation he toned down the high places ripped out the idolatry and served the lord with all his heart whereas manasseh second verse he did evil in the eyes of the lord following the detestable practice of the nations that the lord has given out before the israelites in comparison we see about hezekiah 
all Judah and the people of Jerusalem honored him when he died, and Manasseh his son succeeded him as a king. So <clears throat> here Manasseh reverses every good thing that his father has done, and verses one through nine gives us a list of some of the terrible sins of King Manasseh. So to name few, he rebuilt the high places his father Hezekiah has demolished. His wicked idolatry is compared with that of former King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel. He bought the idolatry's altars right into the courts of the temple of the Lord. Next, the We have seen his, he sacrificed his own sons in the fire, practiced divination, sought women and consulted mediums and spirits. He even practiced the atrocity of the child sacrifice, sacrificing his own sons to pagan gods. Manasseh was also involved in witchcraft, in divination and in the occult. And verse 16 reveals that Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end, besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit, so that they did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Manasseh, the king of Judah, has done more evil than Amorites, who preceded him and has led Judah into sin with his idols. In Genesis chapter 15, God told Abraham his descendants would not inherit the promised land until the iniquity of the Amorites at Preet has reached its full extent. Now, the people of Judah, like the Israelites, have reached the same point. Now, here is the question. What, what king of Judah had the, has the longest reign? It is Manasseh. 55 years. Manasseh has the Longest reign of any kings of either Judah or Israel. Next, what king was the most wicked of all the kings of Judah? Again, Manasseh. But was not Manasseh was the son of good king Hezekiah? Yes. How could such a godly father produce such an ungodly son? The answer is the expression like father, like son, certainly does not apply to the sting of <coughs> Judean kings. Manasseh made Judah sin by doing what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Manasseh not only did great wickedness himself, but he led the entire nation of Judah further into evil into the sight of the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I'm going to bring such a disaster on Jerusalem and Judah that the ears of everyone who hears of it will tingle. In verses 12 to 13 are the Lord's very descriptive prediction about the coming of captivity of Judah on the destruction of Jerusalem at the hand of Babylonians. And the first one who hears of it will, everyone who hears of it will tingle. The calamity would be such that ears would tingle. In other words, the horror would be a shocking to all who heard. I will stretch out over Jerusalem the measuring line used again as Samaria and the plumb line used again as the house of Ahab. The same plumb line standard that God used to prove Samaria's overwhelming guilt would be used against Jerusalem. And we know what has already happened in Samaria. Next, I will wipe out Jerusalem as one wife's a dish, wiping it and turning it upside down. See, as, dish, as dishes are wiped out and turned upside down to dry. So, God would do with the Jerusalem. The 
i will the lord <coughs> spoke i will forsake the remnant of the inheritance and give them into the hands of enemies they will be looted and plundered by all their enemies they have done evil in my eyes and have aroused my anger from the day their ancestors came out of egypt until this day next king manasa was held responsible for the coming judgment because he had done these abominations himself and led and led the nation into a grave sin so the lord brought against them the army command of the king of assyria who took manasa prisoner put a hook in his nose bound him with bronze shackles and took him to babylon the lord spoke to manasa and his people but they paid no attention so what happens next and when he prayed to him the lord was moved by his entreaty and listened to his plea so he brought him back to jerusalem and to his kingdom the author of second kings left out the account of manasa exile and repentance because the books of kings and chronicles they are focusing on two different themes king the book of kings want to show that wickedness led the people into exile whereas chronicles want to show that the repentance can bring them back into god's favor however when manasa was in distress we see here that he humbled himself before the lord and prayed to him recognizing that the lord was god now look at the how the 13 ends then manasa knew that the lord is god you see friends don't miss in the simplicity how amazing this is he is finally come to that moment and a little humble repentance goes a long way with god god forgave manasa his sins brought about his release from prison and his restoration to kingship in juda manasa demonstrated his repentance and his gratitude to god in good works and repentance always leads to reform and verse 17 tells us that they did not make it all the way there the people however continued to sacrifice at the high places but only to the lord their god see that they did not make all the way there still we can see the blind spots in their lives next manasse rested with his ancestors and was buried in his palace so when we come to end of his life most of it which was deeply wicked compromised life the repentance from manasse occurred in the last years so the bulk of his 15 years of reign has been this evil king however friends there are two miracles in this passage don't miss them number 1 manasse changes he repents that is a miracle and the number 2 god forgive there is always more grace for the humble Amen was 22 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 2 years on the last part of the verse but unlike his father Manasse he did not humble himself before the lord Amon increased his guilt next Amon's officials conspired against him and assassinated him in his place Manasse finally at the end of his days in the moment of his great tribulation he returns to god but his son amon got the same message but did not want anything to do with it but 
a murderous plot stopped him from doing more damage righteousness god in his perfect character exemplifies true righteousness as humans we are born with an utter lack of righteousness before god romans 310 tells the truth there is no one righteous not even one we cannot measure to measure up god perfect righteousness god understands our human dilemma god freely offers us his righteousness without any contribution on our part when we place our faith in jesus his righteousness covers us through his blood shed on the cross so this takes us to the first principle god's righteousness and grace abounds to humble and contrite sinners god's righteousness and grace abounds to humble and contrite sinners so dear beloved in today's passage the message of manasa example is a warning to us not to presume upon the grace of god the lord is slow to anger and exceedingly patient but if you take advantage of this patience by remaining in your sin careful you can expect severe discipline friend have you been evil at all of your days like manasa pagan idolatry killing your own sons with ungodly brought up will you have the measure of true greatness humility contrition repentance friend check it out for yourself there is still hope for you but you need to repent may it be said of you as it was said of manasa and when he or she was in distress he entreated the favor of the lord his god and humbled himself greatly let's move to our second division god's righteousness prevails through promises finally a king who did what was right in the eyes of the lord and followed the ways of his father david not turning aside to the right or to the left because amon was assassinated after just two years as a king josiah was only eight years old when he became king maybe in his first years he was too young when king josiah was 16 years old he began to seek the god of his father david when he was 20 years old he began to put judah and jerusalem of high places and when he is 26 years old he purified the land and the temple to repair the temple of the lord his god next hilka the priest found the book of the law when this repairs led to the discovery of the book of the law friends god does not hide himself anymore first he rise josiah in the knowledge in the knowledge of his name and now he makes his hidden word found by his people now they present the book of the law to the king and read it to him when the heard, when the king heard this words of the law he tore his robes and gave these orders go and enquire of the lord for me and for the remnant of israel josiah so how did josiah respond when he heard the words of the law josiah tore his robes and he served the lord go and enquire of the lord for me great is the lord's anger that is poured out on us because those who who have gone before us have not kept the word of the lord they have not acted in accordance with all that is written in this book 
Josiah takes the word of God seriously. He acknowledges God's claim on his people. He recognizes that Israel has deserved God's anger. Friend, how much do you take God's threat seriously and mourn about the situation, the church, and the community where you are in? Because people have ignored God and rejected his will. Are you concerned about this? Do you treasure God's word and realize its significance for your life and for the society you live in? Let's thank God for the blessings that his word is available and that God does not hide himself for us. As a response to the lawlessness and the rebellion against him in our society today. Josiah wants to anchor of the Lord because he knows the wrath of the Lord is kindled against them because they have not obeyed the words in his book. Hiliki and those the king had sent him, sent with him, went to speak to prophet Huldah. So the priest goes to Hulda, the prophetess, and she gives the word of the Lord to them. And she reconfirms one once again. God would bring disaster upon Judah because they had forsaken him and turned to the other gods. And God's unquenchable anger would be poured out upon them. Then about Josiah, this is the only one positive statement from the Lord. The message is directed to King Josiah because Josiah responded to the Lord with humility and repentance. He would not personally experience the disaster that would befall on Judah. Next, after consultation with the Hulda, the prophetess, in response, Josiah assembled the people and read the book of covenant to them. He renewed their covenant with the Lord and had everyone pledge them themselves to obedience. And Josiah removed all the detestable idols from the territory and led the people to serve the Lord. And further information the Second Kings provides where it is very clear just how bad the moral and spiritual conditions were before Josiah's revival. We also see how sweeping reforms were as a result of his revival. Gross idolatry was being practiced in the temple area, including ritual homosexual. Joshua did away with all the spiritual and moral corruption. Next, child sacrifice was being practiced in Judah. And Josiah destroyed the pagan altar to Molech. So the horrendous atrocity of child sacrifice could no longer be practiced. And verses 15 to 18, even after it, <coughs> Bethel, the high place made by the Jeroboam son of Nebuch, who had caused Israel to sing, when, when he saw, in accordance with the word of the Lord proclaimed, the man of God, I'm coming back to verse 15, even the altar at Bethel, the high places made by Jeroboam, son of Naboth, who had caused Israel to sin. Here, the verse 15 to 18 describes Josiah's removal of the idolatrous golden calf shine in Bethel, set up by King Jeroboam I. And this fulfilled And this fulfilled the prophecy made by a prophet of Judah about 300 years before this time. Altar, altar, this is what the Lord says. A son named Josiah will be born to the house of David. On you, he will sacrifice the priests of the high places who make offerings here. And human beings will be burnt on you. You see? 
he took the bones out of the tombs on the mount of the time of jeroboam one and burned them on the altar next after removing the false worship josiah re reinstated the passover which was to be kept by the children of israel as a memorial before the lord throughout their generation look at verse 18 the passover had not been observed like this in israel since the days of the prophet samuel and none of the kings of israel had ever celebrated such a passover as did josiah so interestingly second chronicle chapter 35 assigns 19 verses to the great passover which details regarding the preparations of this passover celebration josiah appointed priests and encouraged them in their duties he instructed the levites to consecrate and prepare themselves by families and slaughter the lambs provided by josiah and his officials musicians and gatekeepers were set at their posts and this passover celebration was like no other since the days of samuel the discovery of the law of god led to a major revival the greatest revival up to this time in judah's history verse 25 neither before nor after josiah was there a king like him there is a king like him who turned to the lord as he did with all his heart with all his soul with all his strength in accordance with all the law of moses verse 26 nevertheless the lord did not turn away from the heat of his fierce anger which burnt against judah because of all that manasseh had done to arouse his anger see verse 25 records that no one turned to the lord with all his heart like josiah did no one was as intense with his repentance than josiah but the lord did not turn away from his anger because of all the evil that manasseh had done remember that is what the prophet has said judgment is not going to be averted it will only be delayed until after josiah's reign friends so here is what we want us to think about why did josiah go about doing all of these reforms when he knows very well that it, it was not going to change the outcome of god's wrath on his nation and why did he so intensely return to the lord when the outcome was not going to change the answer is that he cared about god so much he did not serve god because of the outcome he served god with all his heart soul and strength regardless of the outcome friend this is what you are called to do as god's people because he loved us and saved us we do this for him not because we are concerned of by the outcome even if it looks like doing so is hopeless and pointless the end of josiah's reign so it was the fateful year that 6009 bc it was the beginning of the end for the covenant people of southern kingdom of judah after all this when josiah has set to the had set the temple in order nico king of egypt went up to fight at carchemish on the euphrates and josiah marched out to meet with him in the battle but nico sent a messenger to him saying what quarrel is there king of judah between you and me it is not you I am attacking at this time, but the house which I am at war. God has told me to hurry, so stop opposing God. 
who is with me or he will destroy you josaya however would not retreat, would not turn away from him <laughs> reading between the lines of this both accounts it seems egypt was on its way to fight assyria babylon became the dominant power in the ancient world josaya thought that he could intervene and stop pharaoh neko at megiddo a major crossroad in the ancient world josaya did not heed neko's warning he entered the battle in disguise and was badly wounded his officers then took him to jerusalem and where he died he was buried in the tombs of his ancestors and all judah and jerusalem mourned for him so after his death all judah and jerusalem mourned for josiah now the question why did god allow josiah to die i don't know how we have discussed in your discussion groups today yesterday in our leaders meeting this is one of our important question doubt expressed by many leaders why did god allow josiah to die he did not believe that god would speak through him to a pagan king or the passover had just taken place so he may have been over jealous and off god or he may be acted without first consulting god or was this an indication that josiah continued to trust in alliances with powers like assyria rather than trusting in the lord alone friends whatever the reason even though he started so well and did so much good josiah falls even our best leaders are not perfect even our best leaders die eventually and also other important lesson you can take you can learn from this sad conclusion of josiah's life is constant dependence god is needed to navigate life challenges god sometimes works in in ways we do not expect <coughs> now if you will scan your bibles in the final chapters you will notice that the author quickly gives his narrative about the final four kings of judah none of these kings are given a significant amount of attention telling telling us that their actions are not focused for the end of the nation all four kings did evil in god's sight and led to judah eventually exile and soon after babylon defeated egypt at the battle of carchemish it is important to realize that three major invasions of judah by nebuchadnezzar and the babylonians are described in this last two chapters of second kings the first invasion during the king of jehoiakim and the second invasion during the reign of jehoiachin this is the period in the second invasion the prophet ezekiel was taken to babylon along with many other captives and the third and final invasion took place during the reign of king zedekiah but look at verse 8 through 21 he set fire to the temple of the lord the royal palace and all the houses of jerusalem every important building he burned down next the whole babylonian army under the command of the imperial god broke down the walls around the jerusalem and nebuzar nebuzaradan the command of the god carried into exile the people who remained in the city so the author gives us a detailed account of the destruction of the temple the temple is burnt 
everything of any value is stripped from the temple whatever could not be taken was smashed to pieces without the temple the people cannot be forgiven nor be in fellowship with god so the hope of the people and the world appears to be gone throughout this sad record it might be emphasized that all these invasions of jerusalem and juda were not by chance they happened just as the just as the lord has said see verse 13 as the lord has declared nebuchadnezzar neither neither removed the treasures from the temple of the lord he carried all jerusalem into exile verse 2 the lord sent babylon to destroy juda in accordance with the word of the lord proclaimed by his servants the prophets verse 3 according to the lord's command surely these things happened in juda in order to remove them from his presence because of the sins of manasse and all he has done the past prophecies of judgment were fulfilled just as the lord had said in mercy patience and love god repeatedly sent messengers and prophets to draw the people back to him but the people mocked god messengers despised god's words and scoffed at his prophets friend this book does not end with the destruction of the temple as we might expect the book does not end with the final kings the book does not end with the people moving to egypt for fear of the babylonians but the book ends in a strange note look at verses 27 through 30 in the 13th seventh year of the exile of jehochin king of juda in the year of all martu became king of babylon he released jehochin <coughs> king of juda from prison he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat of honor higher than those of other kings who were with him in babylon so the book ends with jehoshin who had been taken into babylon's exile having a reversal of fortune he is released from the prison by the new king babylon first jehoshin is important because he is the king king's line to jesus the survival of jehoshkim is important because it will be his sons that will ultimately bring the savior of the world the book inspires a final hope the gospel of matthew opens with announcement of the king jesus that when the king comes everything that had been lost will be restored when the king comes the solution to all our problems will have come friends this is a message of open reason why we are all going to celebrate the birth of our king and savior lord jesus christ in few weeks to follow god's story never ends without the message of hope so he is our final principle god reveals his righteousness when he shows mercy and compassion god reveals his righteousness when he shows mercy and compassion <coughs> dear friends this lesson <clears throat> teaches us that god's righteousness is the cause of both condemnation and justification he is righteous in saving sinners as well as merciful and compassionate the goodness of the gospel is that salvation by grace is offered to all men by the righteousness of jesus christ we are all forgiven for our sins and made righteous and nothing we can offer will ever measure up to god's standard of righteousness friends 
how can you, you truly grasp your, your sinfulness and need for God without feeling hopeless? In what ways does a true assessment of yourself lead you to humbly seek God and His righteousness? And how are you blessed to know that when God looks at you, He sees the perfect rightness of Son in your life? And in what ways are you experiencing glorious freedom from guilt, shame, and slavery to sin? And how will you thank Jesus for his sacrifice that allows you to stand before God fully clothed in his righteousness? Friend, it will not matter how effectively you have convinced yourself that you are okay with God. You are not okay. You must take corrective action or you will or we too may drift so far. Remember that the real problem is no longer in the world in which we live but right in our heart. Let's bow down before the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being gracious and merciful God. Lord, you pursue your children even when they, when they have turned away from you. We saw in the present lesson how you did that with ungrateful and wicked kings in Israel's history. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, our Savior through whom it is possible to come back to come back to you. Lord, if there's anyone here this evening living in sin and disobedience, we pray that you would convict them right now. We pray that you would open their eyes and we also want to see your name should be praised for your grace and mercy, bringing sinners like us to repentance. This we pray it in Jesus. Magnificent name. Amen. So thank you, friends. Class has been dismissed. We are going to meet next week at the same time. Thank you. Wish you all a good week. <laughs>